Good evening. Welcome to our prayer meeting broadcast. Uh, we are excited to continue our series, The Blueprint, the study of the book of Nehemiah. And today we're going to be studying chapters 3 and 4. It's the second study that we do in this uh, book. Uh, last week we saw chapters 1 and 2, and we saw that Nehemiah's first tool to build the wall was prayer. Let's see what the second tool today will be, and I hope that you enjoy as we... Uh, uh, you know, break down this chapters, two chapters, three and four. Uh, some prayer requests have come to us, and uh, we would like to remind you to pray for Jean Huang and also for uh, Dorinda Blank as they continue to deal with their, their health issues. Uh, pray for the Martella family, for Larry and Ruth and their extended family. Pray for the Olson family, Don and May and their extended family. Pray for the Phillips family, Ed and Janine and their extended family. Pray for the Noel family, Gary and his extended family. Pray for the Kramers, Ken and Donna, and their extended family. Uh, for Peggy Roth and her extended family. And for uh, Fernando Martinez uh, and his extended family. So let me pray at this moment. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before your presence uh, tonight as we present, O oh Lord, before you all the requests that uh, we have asked to pray for these families. Uh, we ask in a mighty way that you be with Jean and Dorinda and whomever is in need of your health today. The Arsadon family is, is a reminder in my mind. Also the uh, sons of uh, Sister Rita, we ask that you may visit them as well. But tonight we would like to uplift before you the Martella family, Larry and Ruth, and we ask that you may give them health and many, many blessings as well. Be with the Olson family, uh, Don Olson and his wife May, that you may continue to give them health and blessings. With the, uh, for the Ed, uh, Ed, uh, Phyllis family, Ed and Janine, that you may continue to bless them and give them health. Also be with uh, the uh, Noel family, with Gary. Uh, we're so thankful for his ministry in our church. Be with uh, the Kramer family as well, Ken and Donna that you may continue to bless them. Be with the uh, Roth family, uh, Peggy. Although she's not a member of our church, she's always a visitor, and, 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 you know, and often, uh, she's often here, so we ask that you may continue to bless her. The same with uh, Fernando Martinez. He's not a member, but he's here all the time, and we ask, oh Lord, that you may continue to bless him, especially with the issue he has with his shoulder, oh Lord, that you may provide healing for him. Uh, bless our church in a mighty way, our community, uh, and as we open your scriptures today, that you may speak to each and every one of us to the, tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The blueprint. Uh, next week, we're going to be studying the enemy from within, chapters 5 and 6. That is next week. And then today, we're going to be build, uh, studying chapters 3 and 4, builders of the wall. And this is what, uh, how we're going to start. We're going to start by reading Nehemiah chapter 3. Verses 1 and 2. Eliashib, the high priest, and his fellow priests, priests went to work and rebuilt the sheep gate. They dedicated it and set its doors in place, building as far as the Tower of the Hundred, which they dedicated, and as far as the Tower of Heniel. Verse 2. The men of Jericho built the adjoining section, and Sakur, some of Imri, built next to them. Nehemiah chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. After all the agitation that came from Sambalat and Tobias, as we saw last week, many felt threatened and intimidated to join the project that Nehemiah, uh, you know, brought to the table to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. However, when, when the high priest at this time, Eli Eliashib, and his fellow priests come to join Nehemiah, this was a boost. Uh, you know, people were uh, you know, happy about this. The high priest is the first person mentioned who pitched in and helped with the work. Uh, spiritual leaders must lead not only by word, but also by action. And that's what uh, we're seeing here with the high priest getting involved in this reconstruction of the wall. Now, Maya was going to need as many as possible, uh, willing to sacrifice time and effort uh, in order for him to achieve such huge project. Uh, these new leaders joining Nehemiah's project could, could have come to criticize his plan and strategy, but rather they came with the attitude of a servant leader. A servant leader is willing to put his or her, her agenda on hold to help the current leader and the nation of Israel, in this case, to be restored. 
Nehemiah needed to form a team. Uh, teamwork was going to be the key for them to build this wall. The sheep gate was the gate used uh, to bring sheep into the city, to the temple for sacrifices. So it was a key gate. You know, it was uh, an important gate because the animals for sacrifice would come in. And Maya had the priest repair this gate because it was related to the sanctuary and, and the section of the wall as well, respecting the priest's area of interest and at the same time emphasizing the priority of worship. Sheep were essential in the daily sacrifices and in the functions of the priests. Nehemiah started here to emphasize our greatest need, the restoration of our worship to God. And every time they would bring an animal uh, for sacrifices, the, the penitent had to worship God. He came with this attitude of worship. All the citizens of Jerusalem did their part on the huge job of rebuilding the city wall. Similarly, the work of the church requires every member of the church, every member's effort, in order for the body of Christ to function effectively. So we need every single member, adults, uh, median age, and young people. We need, old, we, need, we need people with a lot of experience. We need rookies. We need everybody getting involved so that the body of Christ would uh, benefit and function effectively. The body of Christ needs, needs you. Are you doing your part? Or are, we, are you only criticizing instead of helping? We all need to find a place to serve God and to start contributing whatever time, talent, and money is needed. At this time, Jerusalem was a large city. And because many roads converged here, uh, it was required uh, to have many gates so that uh, it would help these roads when they come in into the city. The wall of each side of these heavy wooden gates was taller and thicker, uh, so soldiers could stand guard to defend the gates against any attack. So it was a, a fortification, a huge fortification that, you know, after thousands of years, is still standing. Uh, sometimes two stone towers guarded the gate. Uh, in times of peace, the city gates were hubs of activity, where city council was held here, uh, even the elders meeting and uh, shopkeepers would come and set up the, their wares at the entrance so that they would sell their products, the produce. You know, so it was, a, it was a big restoration. But the main thing, it was a restoration to worship, to help worship. Now, um, building the city walls and gates was not only a military priority, but it was also a boost for trade and commerce. Uh, and since Israel is trying to reestablish themselves, they needed some cash uh, flowing into the city. Now, notice a very important information that is that, and that is that the uh, a section of the wall was built by the men of Jericho, uh, who built this section, new project. Now, remember the wall of Jericho? Uh, men in Jericho knew a thing or two about building walls. So when the Israelites saw this men from Jericho coming, uh, Nehemiah's plan triggered a massive ent enthusiasm and motivation to build the wall project. Nehemiah's plan was to build the city walls on a counterclockwise direction around Jerusalem. And as we see this couple of maps that I will show you here, highlighted in yellow, if you can see, that was the restoration of the city that Nehemiah did. The other wall, the exterior wall, is the new city of Jerusalem. But that little square on your right side is the old city of Jerusalem. This is the city of David. Uh, this was where the temple was and the rest of the people uh, lived. And I'm, I'm going to show you the next slide. You see again the highlight on the yellow on the slide on the, your left. And you see a model uh, of the uh, old uh, city of David. This is the wall city that Nehemiah reconstructed. Uh, you see there's a couple of gates on the east side. There's one on the south, one, a couple on the north, and a couple on the west side. So you see that that's the model of the city that uh, Nehemiah is building. It was not the new city, the new wall. Uh, so they needed motivation to build. They needed motivation to really get engaged because 
this was a difficult task. And most of them did not know how to do it, but uh, somehow there were some individuals there that were probably teaching them how to do it. In Nehemiah chapter 3, verses 3 to 5, we read, The fish gate was built by the sons of Hanas, Hasena. Uh, they laid its beams and put its doors and bolts and bars in place. Verse 4, Meramoth, son of Arias, the son of Hakos, repaired the next section. Next to him, Meshulam, son of Berechiah, the son of Meshabel, uh, made the repairs. And next to him, Sadak, son of Bana, also made repairs. Verse 5. The next section was repaired by the men of Tekoa, but their nobles would not put their shoulders to the work under their supervisors. Nehemiah chapter 3. Verses 3 to 5. One of the main roads through Jerusalem entered the city through the fish gate. And this city, this uh, gate would come from the northeast, from uh, the corners of the Mediterranean, Lake Galilee, especially from Tyre, Tyre the city of Tyre, and the, the area of Lake Galilee. They would come, uh, merchants would come with baskets of fish, fresh fish, uh, and they would sell it in this market. The nobles of Tekoa, they're mentioned here, they were lazy and wouldn't help. Uh, these men were the only ones who did not support the building project in Jerusalem. Nehemiah was putting together. So every group then, and even churches, will have those who think that they are too wise or important to work hard. Gentle encouragement doesn't sometimes seem to help. Uh, sometimes the best policy is to just ignore them and try to use the other ones who are willing to work. They may think that they are getting away with something, but their inactivity will be remembered by God and by all of those that, who have worked hard. Uh, so the fish gate, as you can see in this slide, is still standing in 2021. And this is the wall that, built, that was built by Nehemiah. Teamwork is needed, right? Teamwork. In Nehemiah chapter 3, 6 to 12, I'm not going to read those sections, but I'm just going to highlight some of the things that are in this section of Nehemiah, Nehemiah 3, 6 to 12. I would like to highlight the following. Number one, that Nehemiah's thorough reporting was essential. He was on point by recording and describing every single detail about the wall project, uh, who built what and where, who built the next section, who, what materials they used, uh, the specifics of every single detail. Uh, secondly, teamwork. We, highlight, you can, we can highlight teamwork. Teamwork was the key to accomplish such a difficult project. Nehemiah was able to put people to work by sections and different people, um, I may add, uh, with different talents, different backgrounds, different desires to do this or, or that. But he was so smart in doing it that he... Um, allow them to build their own sections. Therefore, he was making sure that they would rebuild that section very, very well, very careful. So that, that's a good detail that uh, Nehemiah, new style, strategy that he used. He did this by putting, like I said, people of the same groups by section. Interestingly enough, the daughters of Shalom are mentioned here. And they were able also to work uh, in difficult, uh, the difficult work of repairing the, the city wall. So women also were involved. Uh, rebuilding Jerusalem's walls was a matter of national emergency, national security for the Jews, not just a civic beautification project. This, this was major. They needed to have the walls built. Uh, nearly everyone was dedicated to the task and willing to work at it. And I hope that, you know, we get the same attitude as a church. We need to build the church. We need to build a fortification on the, around this town so that people will be saved from the devil. And, you know, it's a lot of hard work that we need to do and we need everybody. Uh, if we want to be a successful church, we need to have order. We need to be able to work uh, in teamwork. Since our project is to advance the second coming of Christ, everyone is needed in whatever capacity. So it doesn't matter, you know, what you do or what you don't do, as long as you join a team, teamwork. That's what we need to form and to be successful. The restoration of the city walls demanded a strategic plan. It demanded that each worker would feel uh, ownership in the project. So uh, like I mentioned before, the walls will bring this benefit of protection, safety, and commercial growth. So everyone will be benefiting from all this wall. So everyone was involved. So it demanded this step-by-step -step plan uh, that was put together by uh, Nehemiah uh, to construct each, each section, gate, and tower of the wall with the same materials and construction style. 
uh, to achieve construction coherent, coherence. Uh, last week, we learned that Nehemiah's first step in rebuilding the walls was prayer. This week, he has another recommendation that we'll see uh, later, but each week, expect new, a new tool recommended by Nehemiah. Uh, so strategic planning is also recommended. And I mentioned to you the first tool that he used was prayer. So the second step that we need in order for us to rebuild a wall is a strategic planning. In Nehemiah chapter 3, 13 through 15, that he mentions, and I'm going to highlight, I'm not going to read it, but I'm going to highlight some of the things in this area, in this section. The Don Gate is mentioned, and that was the gate through which the people would carry their garbage to be burned in the Valley of Hinnom. Uh, in the Bible, the Don Gate uh, had several negative connotations. For example, in Job 20, verse 7, it was that which shall perish. So it had to do with death. Uh, in Ezekiel 4, uh, 12 and 15, it has to do with defiles. Uh, in Exodus 29, 14, it had to do with uncleanness. And 2 Kings 9, 37, with use, uselessness. So you see that it had a negative connotation. But make no mistake about it. This gate was crucial. It was essential as the, any other gate. Why? Because if the trash would be, uh, remain in the city, it would carry or it would bring infections and diseases. So therefore, the fact that they were able to use this gate to, to uh, this, you know, this, uh, uh, get rid of, of this garbage, it was a blessing. So this uh, uh, you know, uh, gate was essential uh, in the uh, triumph and success of Jerusalem. The Valley of Hinnom, which is in this area, was also more complicated and negative connotation as well. This valley had an evil, evil reputation because uh, some parents in Israel many years before, before made their children pass through fire. In other words, they sacrificed them in the valley of Hinnom, of Hinnom which is the valley of fire, through uh, sacrifices to Baal and Moloch. Uh, King Ahaz, for example, and King Manasseh were guilty of such horrible abomination. So the Don Gate was essential. Um, we can see a picture here of the uh, current wall that was used to uh, transport the garbage out of the city. The horse gate in Nehemiah chapter 3, 28 to 32. I'm not going to read it, but again, I'm highlighting some of the stuff that is found in these uh, verses. The horse gate was at the far eastern point of the wall uh, facing the Kidron Valley. Now, each priest, this is not far away from the temple, from the uh, temple rock. So, uh, you know, they were, uh, he uh, and Nehemiah put the priests in charge to build this wall. Uh, so they did a good job because they wanted to protect the temple. So each priest repaired their wall in front of, the, of his own house, in addition to the other sections in this area. If each person was responsible for the part of the wall closer to his own house, then, number one, he would be more motivated to build it quickly and properly. Two, he, he wouldn't waste time traveling to more distant parts of the wall to build other walls when they can build their own right in front of their house. Number three, he would defend his own home if the wall were attacked. So that he was making sure that this section of the wall was strong and well done. Number four, he would be able to make uh, the building a family effort. And, you know, all of this strategy was brought in by uh, Nehemiah. So if you can see, he used prayer the first time. Now he's using a strategic planning. Every single detail, detail is part of this general strategic planning. Nehemiah's strategy was able to blend self-interest with the group objectives. And that was a smart move because it helped in the process everyone to feel that the world project was their own, was his or her own project. If you are part of a group working on a large project, like us, the church, make sure each person sees the importance and the meaning of the job. Uh, kind of, you know, create some ownership so that they uh, see the, the relevance. Uh, this will ensure high quality work and personal satisfaction. The uh, inspection gate uh, was also found near the horse gate. It was the next one. And this gate, as the name, uh, you know, pertains, uh, it suggests that people will enter through here uh, they will be inspected. It was kind of a, a, of a checkpoint, if you will, to make sure that whoever was entering uh, the city would be checked and would be known who, you know, their whereabouts. This uh, gate connected 
with the road uh, to Mount of Olives. And not only that, this road was also connected to the road to Damascus and other important roads. So it was a, an important gate. Uh, let's continue reading in Nehemiah chapter 4. I'm going to read chapter uh, 4, 1 through 5. Let me drink some water first. Verse 1. When Sabalat heard, or Sambalat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed, ridiculed the Jews. Verse 2. And in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, What are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those uh, heaps of rubble burned as they are? Verse 3, Tobiah the Ammonite who was at his side said, What are they building? If, they, if even a, a fox climbed up on it, he would break down their wall of stones. See, they're, they're making fun of it. Verse 4, Hear us, O or, or our, or our God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Verse 5, do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. This is Nehemiah praying to God about this issue. Sambalat was the governor of Samaria, the region just north of Judea where Jerusalem was located. Sambalat may have hoped to become governor of Judea as well. And this is what's happening. So, uh, you know, um, uh, Nehemiah is struggling with all of this stuff. Uh, uh, you know, he's trying, Sambalat is trying to spoil Nehemiah's plans. Sambalat tried to scare Nehemiah away or to intimidate him by discouraging him uh, by scorning and threats and bluffs. Almost 300 years before Nehemiah's time, the northern kingdom of Israel was conquered and most of the people were carried away uh, captive. So Sargon of Syria repopulated Israel with the Samaritans. And, you know, the Samaritan people with the Israelites, they were not in good standing. Uh, so this is what's happening here. To, so I can give you, I'm giving you here the historical context of why the Samaritans are not relating well to Nehemiah's people. So, you know, ridicule can cut deeply, causing discouragement and despair. Uh, Sambalat and Tobiah did a good job about rid ridiculing uh, Israel and dis dissuading the Jews from building the wall. But instead of trading insults, however, Nehemiah prayed. And we saw that in chapters 1 and 2. Uh, and the word continued. When we are mocked or when you are mocked for your faith or criticized for doing what you know is right, refuse to respond in the same way or to become discouraged. Tell God how you feel and remember his promise is to be with you. Nehemiah is not praying for revenge, nor because he's afraid or avoiding confrontation. He's praying so that God's justice will be carried out. His prayer is similar to many of uh, you know, prayers like before, like David prayers. In, uh, for example, in Psalm chapter 7, 1 to 6, we read, O Lord my God, I take refuge in you. Save and deliver me from all who pursue me. Verse 2, or they will tear me. Tear me like a lion or rip me to pieces with no one to rescue me. Verse 3, O Lord my God, if I have done this and there is guilt in my, on my hands. Verse 4, if I have done evil to him who is at peace with me or without cause, have robbed me my foe. Uh, my foe. Verse 5, then let my enemy pursue and overtake me. Let him trample my life to the ground and make me sleep in the dust. Verse 6, arise, O Lord, in, in your anger. Rise up against the rage. Rage of my enemies. Awake, my God, decree justice. Psalm 7. So Nehemiah is praying similar prayers as David. And that is important in our context. Continue reading in Nehemiah chapter 4, 6 to 13. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height. For the people worked with all their heart. Verse 7. But then Sambalat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the men of Ashad heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed. They were very angry. Verse 8. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. Verse 9. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. Verse 10. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said the strength of the labor laborers is going out and there is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Verse 11. Also, our enemies said, before they know it or see us, 
we will be right there among them and we will kill them and put an end to their work. Now notice this, this threat. He says, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them. You see how the enemy works? Perhaps he doesn't bring you enemies from the outside. Perhaps he brings enemy, enemies from within. And this is the strategy of the devil. This is what he's doing here. Verse 12, then the Jews who lived near the, uh, them came and told us that then 10 times over, whenever you turn, they will attack us. Verse 13, therefore I stationed some of the people behind the lowest point of, of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. This is Nehemiah, uh, I'm sorry, and bows. Nehemiah chapter 4, 6 to 13. The work of, of rebuilding the wall progressed well because the people had set their hearts in it and their minds, and they were accomplishing the task. They did not lose faith or give up, but they persevered in the work and even during the pressure of being, uh, the pressure of being attacked. If God has called you to a task, determine to complete it, even if you face opposition or discouragement. A strong opposition formed against Nehemiah and the workers. They plotted together to come and fight and even kill them if possible. However, Nehemiah and his team prayed but uh, pray to our God, they did that. But not only that, they also posted a guard day and time. So listen to this. They were not only praying, they were doing things as well. So they were not only saying things, they were also doing things. And that's what we need in the church. We need people that when the rubber meets the road are able to do what they're saying, what, you know, what, what they're uh, planning and this is what Nehemiah is doing. In other words, not only did they pray, but they also took strategic action against the attack. Not only was Nehemiah and the workers getting opposition from the outside, but also from the inside, from people in Jerusalem. As the people in Judah began to criticize the amount of work needed for the construction of the wall. So, you know, we get opposition. Every, anytime you're building a wall, a spiritual war in our, uh, wall in our case... You know, we get opposition from the devil. We get opposition from our sinful nature. We get opposition even from church members, our family of the church. You know, and that's the enemy working so that you stop building. So we need prayer, preparation, and planning. These are the three steps that so far uh, Nehemiah has done. Nehemiah constantly combined prayer with preparation and planning. Uh, his people trusted God, and at the same time, they kept vigilant, uh, vig vigilant watch over what had been entrusted to them. Too often we pray without looking for what God wants us to do. Uh, we show God we are serious when we combine prayer with thought, with preparation, and with effort. So accomplishing, accomplishing any large task is tiring. There are many pressures that often foster discouragement. The only cure for fatigue and discouragement is focusing on God's purpose. See, when we do things for the Lord, it's not our job. This is our responsibility. It is God's job. Uh, you know, he will fulfill it. He will finish it. But he needs us to work together with him. And therefore, he will bless our efforts. Nehemiah reminded the workers of their calling, of their goal, and uh, of their uh, God's protection. So they were not afraid of, of, of being left, uh, you know, by themselves. If you are overwhelmed by an assignment, by, uh, if you're tired or discouraged, remember God's purpose for your life and his special purpose for his project. And he will then give you encouragement and he will equip you so that you can finish his will. Now, the people working on the walls face continual threat of terrorist attacks uh, from those who didn't want to see Jerusalem rebuilt. Uh, so then Nehemiah again used this three P, uh, P's, right, that I call prayer, preparation, and planning. Now, preparation and planning is just one step. So they're combined. Preparation and planning is the same thing. So last week we saw prayer. This week we're saying, seeing preparation and planning. Now, likewise, we will face similar opposition when you and I decide to rebuild the walls of this church. Uh, and um, what I'm saying is that we don't need any walls, but what I'm saying, spiritual walls. And, you know, Nehemiah's was, uh, his actions were wise, uh, practical steps to counter the threats that the enemy brought to him. So therefore, they could serve us the same way. Number one, he stationed guards at obvious weak points. And we need to understand that we, all of us, have weaknesses. And we need to strengthen those weaknesses. 
through prayer, through the study of the Word of God, through, uh, you know, uh, trying to be able to remain faithful to God in our weaknesses. And that's what uh, the station of guards mean. Number two, he reminded the workers to keep uh, weapons close at hand and to fight for God, for their families and for the nation if an attack w- would happen. And, you know, that's what we need to do. We have our weapon. Our weapon is the Word of God, the sword of, of salvation. And we have it here. We need to use it. We need to, you know, do work and have the, the weapon in our other hand to make sure that, you know, if the enemy attacks, we're ready to defeat him. Through prayer is another weapon. Prayer, attendance of church, that's another weapon. Studying our Bible. You know, we need to have all of these weapons available. Number three, he established duty rotations so that, uh, you know, um, when someone was working, someone else will be standing, guarding them. So, you see, we need people in our church to help each other. When you're struggling, we need people praying for you. Uh, you know, when someone is struggling and, and the devil is about to destroy them, we need to not abandon them. We need to pray for them and help them out. You know, help them to come back to church. Help them to, to feel welcome in our church. And, you know, sometimes the people are go, go away and they all point the fingers at the pastor. It's your fault that they're not here. No, it's everybody's fault if that's the case. But is, in reality, an individual makes a decision. And we need to help them reconsider that decision. So if they don't want to be here because they feel threatened or because they're embarrassed, we need to help them so that they will come back to church. And this is what the duty of rotations was doing on behalf of Nehemiah. These preparations for defense and the continuation of the work uh, reverse the effects of terrorism and demoralize the enemies. Obstacles and foes can make us work smarter and live wiser, or it can destroy us as well. So we need to determine what is it going to be. If they accomplish the latter, uh, the destruction, then they have won. But if they haven't actually attacked us, uh, we need to remain faithful to God. Those are the practical steps. As I finish the chapter 4, uh, let me read verses 14 through 23. Verse 14. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons and your daughters and your wives and your homes. Verse 14, when our enemies had, um, heard, that, heard that they were aware of their plot and that God has, had frustrated it, he, we all returned to the wall, each to his own work. Verse 16, from that day on, half of my men did the work while the other half were, were equipped with spears, shields, bows, and armor, the officers posted themselves behind all the people of Judah uh, who were building the wall. Those who carried materials did their work with one hand and held a weapon in the other hand. <laughs> Verse 18. And each of the builders were, uh, wore his sword on, at his side as he worked. But the man who sounded the trumpet stayed with me. Now, this, this is an additional weapon system that he had. A man with a trumpet. Listen to this, verse 19. Then I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, the work is extensive, extensive and spread out. We are, uh, and we are widely separated from each other along the wall. Verse 20. Whatever you hear the sound of the trumpet, right? Whenever, whatever you hear it, whenever you hear it, join, join us there because our God will fight for us. So uh, when the trumpet will sound, it will be because of an attack. So this is the strategy the alarm system Nehemiah was putting. Verse 21, so we continue the work with half the men holding spears from the first light of dawn dawn, until the stars came out the whole day, basically. Verse 22, at that time, I also said to the people, have every man and his helper stay inside Jerusalem at night so they can serve us as guards by night and workmen by day. Verse 23, neither I nor my brothers nor my men nor the guards with me took off our clothes, each had his weapon, even when he went for water. So this was a really, really tough uh, time in Israel as they rebuilt. The rebuilding of the wall at Jerusalem was a war song. It was both a physical and spiritual war. The enemy's opposition to the rebuilding of the wall in Jerusalem were in reality the opposition 
to the reestablishment of the sacrifice system that reminded the people of God, the sinners, of the coming of the Messiah. You see, the devil himself was trying to avoid the reconstruction of the world because they knew that the temple will be reused again and the sacrifices, which remind the people of the salvation of the Redeemer that the Redeemer will bring. And Satan wanted none of that. Uh, so God promised to Abraham that, you know, Israel was his people. And, and the fact that the sacrifices was a matter of eternal life or eternal salvation. You see, Satan was trying to avoid that. He, he was trying to avoid you or us to make that eternal decision, either for salvation or condemnation. And, you know, he, as much as he can avoid that, he would try to do that. But Jesus wants everybody to come to that folk fork in the, in the, on the pathway, in the journey of our lives where we can decide. Deuteronomy chapter 30 says that, that you know, uh, we have been offered life and death. And then he says, he says, I have often both, but uh, please choose life. So this is what is happening here. This is a matter of eternal salvation or condemnation. This was war. Now, likewise, every time we try to build the walls of our spiritual cities or lives, the walls of the church, you know, the enemy comes to us with his whole arsenal of weapons trying to stop God's church. And dear church, we cannot afford, listen to me, we cannot afford to stop building the wall. We cannot afford to stop building our, our walls. You know, we cannot afford, afford that. The moment we stop building, then we are dead. Then we, are, we will be removed from the path of salvation. And the enemy will take us and destroy us. He will destroy our families. He will destroy our spiritual lives, our desire to be saved. And we cannot afford to be lost, especially today that we're living in the last days. So never stop working. Never stop trying. Keep on trying in spite of who you are, despite the things that you do. Keep on trying. The Lord will have mercy. The Lord will provide a way of salvation for all of us. See, we are at war. And we need to be in the range of the trumpet so that we can hear that it sound. Uh, because it, it sound will advise us of the coming events. You see, Nehemiah's amazing communication system through the trumpets is still in use in Israel today. They don't use the trumpets anymore. However, they use the same concept. And let me explain what I mean. They call it beacons, beacon mountains. I, I've been in Israel and they explained this to me. All throughout Israel, from the north to the south, from the Golan Heights all the way to the Negev in the south, all the way, 12 mountains crisscross the country north to south. And all of these 12 peaks, they have lighthouses and special lights, beacons, that they're able to communicate, send a message through these lights, silent message, not written, not talking, silent messages that the country will understand in less than 10 minutes from north to south that something big is happening. So this is the same concept that Nehemiah is trying to establish here. The trumpet was used under the context of war. This is what the Bible says about the trumpet in 1 Corinthians 14, 8. He says, again, if the trumpet does not sound a clear call, who will get ready for battle? You see the context with the trumpet and war? And this is what uh, Nehemiah is trying to establish. And therefore, Paul is telling us, reminding us as well, that we need to pay attention to that trumpet. The trumpet sound will let us know if, if we are in times of war or what need, need to be done. Nehemiah understood his mission to rebuild the wall of, uh, to be both a spiritual and physical battle. Each man was encouraged to carry a sword in one hand and work in the other hand with the other hand. Likewise, you and I are encouraged to carry the sword of God, the word of God, the Bible in one hand while doing the work required for the building of the kingdom. That means either giving Bible studies. That means even praying for somebody in the street, providing help and, and money and benefits for someone who needs it out there so that they could see Jesus through you. We need to build the kingdom of Jesus 
while we do this. What Nehemiah was infusing in the minds of the people in Jerusalem, he was instilling in their minds of each worker was was that at every moment, at every single moment, during every occasion, you and I need to be ready, alert, prepare for war if necessary. We cannot afford to stop one second in rebuilding our wall, rebuilding that connection that sin broke down, rebuilding that faith that, and trust in God, rebuilding a path to salvation. We need to do this constantly. We cannot afford to be builders we cannot afford not to be builders of the wall. That is why I would like to pray for you tonight so that the Lord may be helping you to be a builder of your wall. That is why I'd like to pray with you tonight so that the Lord may guide you, may sustain you in whatever rebuilding needs to happen in your life here in this church so that the Lord may give us not only prayer, but also a preparation and planning, a strategic plan so that we can do this. The question is, we are builders of the wall. Would you like to join us tonight as builders of the wall? Let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for listening to our prayer, for understanding that we need to pray. That's true. But we also need to do things. We need to act. We need to react. We need to uh, allow the Holy Spirit to use us and to be able to defeat and confront the enemy if we need to, oh Lord. But we'll do it in the name of Jesus. And we ask tonight, there's someone that has been struggling by themselves. That Lord, you'll provide salvation not only for them, but also that you will encourage them. Uh, and, and equip them and, and give them strength so that they can fight the enemy and they can defeat the enemy as well. Bless our church in a mighty way and help us rebuild our walls around us, around this community, oh Lord, around, around our spiritual lives, around our families, husbands and wives and children, about, uh, you know, around our health, around our desire to continue doing your service. So help us, oh Lord, to build this wall because we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, thank you once again for joining us tonight. I hope that you will join us next week as we continue learning from this uh, Nehemiah, what an amazing man of God. Uh, good evening and God bless you. Bye-bye.